You're listening to Natural Resources University. This episode features Working Wild U, hosted by Dr. Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Actually, the sheep are going to the krill right now, guys. So you're coming in just in time. Welcome back to Working Wild U, a show where we explore what it means to share the working landscape with people and wildlife from the crossroads of culture and science. I'm Jared Beaver. And I'm Alex Few. This summer, while I was out in Oregon, I met up with Cameron Krebs, a sheep producer in the northeast corner of the state. All right. I wish we had video because the light is so pretty right now. See him? I want to. I want to get the, the sheep sound. In the oh sheep? yeah, yeah. Okay. We. Oh Damn, yeah. Didn't bring oh my a goodness. We need a it sounds like a pretty nice looking spot for sheep. Yeah, but it's also a pretty hard spot for sheep. The forest allotment that Cameron leases has a lot of wolf activity, and he's made it his mission to figure out, to tinker with, to adapt his livestock husbandry and conflict prevention technology to make his operation work up there. The problem we were trying to solve is drifting sheep and predation at night. By protecting them behind the woven wire fence, we have reduced drift, we've added human presence, and that is all possible by using this polywoven wire. It's light, easy to move, and has long, uh, long duration, long life on the landscape. Cameron is pinning his sheep at night inside electrified woven wire to keep them protected and close to herders during their most vulnerable time. What we're doing is we're using it in a very vast landscape on a very micro scale for one purpose. So it's like when we look at technologies, it's like repurposing them or what what do we have available at our fingertips and how can we use it to solve a problem that is challenging. We're talking about technology and innovation, but sometimes that doesn't have to be high tech to help reduce conflict, but it does need to be practical and fit into the management of a particular operation. For instance, night pinning works on Cameron's operation, but it may not be for everyone. But what we're covering today is how producers and some researchers are working together to adapt old world tools into new world technologies all to help reduce conflicts. Hey, Working Wild, you listeners. We think you'll like another show from the Western Landowners Alliance, the Unland Podcast, a show that features thoughtful conversations with people who are living and working on the land and shaping the future of stewardship in the American West. The Unland Podcast is the audio companion of On Land, the magazine of the Western Landowners Alliance. Check it out at onland.westernlandowners.org and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, we're living in the 21st century. We need to be thinking about new ways of doing things, bringing new ideas in, and merging them with the old ideas. That's Stuart Breck. He's a research biologist with the USDA Wildlife Services National Wildlife Research Center. There's a lot of very relevant things that have been done for hundreds and hundreds of years that are important in these landscapes today. So how do we merge that with the, the new technology? That's, that's where the payload is. So Stewart's job is to innovate and create new conflict prevention tools, and he's been up to this for quite some time. In fact, if you remember from earlier this season, he was actually the intern who worked on the Lazy EL Ranch shortly after wolves were reintroduced. This is the ranch where we heard about the first wolves dispersing out of Yellowstone and the crazy story about wolf with distemper who showed up in their dog bed. So Stewart's job way back when was to monitor the first wolves who left Yellowstone Park after the reintroduction. But he ended up cowboying more or less the whole summer. The word of the day there is uh, serendipity. I was working in Yellowstone early on in the reintroduction effort, just as a technician, and the people running that project sent me out to a ranch to live and monitor a wolf pack. And it was that experience that probably put me into this job because I was open to it, good at it, like enjoyed it, 
you know, working with the ranchers, it was quite an experience. I knew nothing about ranching and they they took me under their wing and, you know, I started off camping out in, you know, trying to monitor this wolf pack and it was miserable spring Montana and pretty soon the ranch family brought me into the into their bunkhouse. They were feeding me, you know, warm meals and um, you know, by the end of the month I you know, I had been building fence and riding riding with the cowboys and just was totally struck by how they were managing their their livestock and thought man this is really cool and so that connection was made early on in Stewart's career and if you fast forward to now now he's working with other producers in Oregon looking at some new innovative work yeah so some of the more fun work that I do and I have to say it is fun so I'm working with a rancher out in northeastern Oregon who this guy has more energy and more ideas than any of us could really handle Stewart's referring to Cameron Krebs, the producer from the top of the show. He's part of forming what we call a, uh, a think tank. So if you can imagine, uh, we have a robotics professor, we have an NGO, we have an engineer, we have this rancher and myself, and every week we gather. And it is by far the most fun meeting I have every week because it, it just goes into these wild directions. Processes such as this, working with and exchanging knowledge with the folks being most impacted by these issues, producers, really help accelerate innovation, or science for that matter. This is co-production, integrating different ways of knowing to make, in this case, conflict prevention tools and the science behind them more useful. You can break down acquiring knowledge into three buckets. One, you read about it. The other is from doing it, first-hand experience. And then the third is you learn from someone else, their first-hand experiences. And it's kind of like this in science, except we often only rely on one of those. Science has been slow in incorporating that knowledge that's been acquired over generations. Traditionally, science has taken more of a dump truck approach. Do the work, produce the results, back it up and dump it out. But with that process, there's no ground level feedback that tells us whether we're doing anything useful. And by including this feedback into the whole research process, including study design, co-production can make strides towards knocking down that old ivory tower science perspective. And co-production can increase innovation and the usefulness of science for people like Cameron and other livestock producers who are looking for less time intensive and more effective ways to reduce conflicts. This is progression in animal agriculture and animal husbandry. And it is like, we can continue to do it traditionally and we will probably get the same challenge we've had for the last turn of the century. I believe that we can continue traditional practices, but utilize modern technology that allows it to be easier for everyone. And Cameron and Stuart are excited about one particular innovation they've been working on together. One of which is uh, is an idea that this rancher has come up with in terms of how to spatially manage his cattle on the landscape using minerals. So this minerals are used in every operation, uh, livestock need it, but he's, so he's built this bin that um, we put the engineer on that helped sort of build the doors that so it'll open and close at set periods and his idea is like let's open it right before it gets dark the cattle will come in train the cattle to come in every night and then his hope is that by gathering them at night they'll stay clumped and the next morning when sun rises they disperse out for forage i would have never come up with some kind of idea like that and back at cameron's place he showed us this innovation at work One of my other goals in designing the bin is that it needed to be, quote, cowboy friendly. It needed to use standard things that you would have. It needed to fit inside a horse trailer. It needed to be like, it couldn't have parts that you had to import from China. It needed to have things that you could run down to your local Napa store or you might have in your pickup, Um, like a set of jumper cables to test it or things like that. So it's friendly on the landscape and and not a challenge or a annoyance to use. This on-the-ground knowledge, how to make things user-friendly, is invaluable to researchers like Stuart, 
who can help to evaluate tools and find resources to support these producer-driven innovative ideas. And really, the most innovative ideas can be simple. This mineral bin is about the same size as my desk. It's on wheels, it's easy to move around, and other than that, it just looks like a feed trough. But when you look inside, it has some simple robotics that open and close a door on a timer. If the bins open, they get a reward. And that was important to me that there's always a reward for coming to the bin at night. And so right now, if you looked in the bin, it would just be white block salt. Really, the bounds of co-producing research such as these salt bins is just being explored and research that supports the needs of producers by developing and evaluating conflict prevention tools is a win for both ag producers and wildlife conservationists. And this type of producer-led innovation is being recognized. Cameron just won the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Theodore Roosevelt Genius Prize for non-lethal management of human-wildlife conflict with his mineral bin idea. I think what's happened more recently is a recognition of closer ties with the agricultural community. Because one of the bigger problems that we face, I face as a researcher, is people not either appreciating the research or really even being interested in it. And so that kind of science where the scientist operates separately from the livestock producer in developing new tools, it's a mistake. It's, and I've been operating that way for 20 years and it's only been recently where the notion of co-producing this work with the livestock producer has become really recognized as critical. And this co-production approach applies to innovations and lethal control as well. Well, I think I've embraced what my agency hired me for, which was to develop non-lethal tools. But I've also have a, a deep understanding that that's not alone the solution. It's gotta be an integration of the lethal carnivore management. That is the future right there, is integrating all that together. The notion that non-lethal tools will always work is crazy. And there's actually probably some real interesting work to be done on can we use um, these non-lethal tools to be more selective in the case where we have to do lethal removal. And this is something to stress. We want to be adding tools at every turn possible, not restricting what can be used to reduce conflicts. I often say we need all the tools in the toolbox, but Jared, you and I agree the term toolbox can create a bit of a misconception. That's right. Our toolbox should not be limited in size. Just because we put a new tool in, shouldn't mean we have to take one out. And when we get back, Jared will be sharing his work to keep adding tools to the ever-growing toolbox. Working Wild U is a proud part of Natural Resources University, a podcast network delivering science-based information for your natural resource management. Other current network series include Timber University, Fish University, Deer University, Fire University, and Habitat University. Available wherever you get your podcasts. So I'm Weston Helly, um, fourth generation rancher. Kind of grew up here. Spent a lot of time in the truck when I was younger, up here attending camp, uh, working sheep. That's John Helly's son, Weston. The Hellies are sheep producers in southwest Montana. We've been kind of scratching our head because people just, the non-lethal word just keeps coming out and coming out. We've been doing it the whole time. Sheep herders and, yeah. and guard dogs are the best tools we have to prevent predation. We've been employing, you know, the best tools we have non-lethally. Uh, we're kind of scratching our heads to what we can do more. When I was out in the gravelies on the heli operation, we got to talking about some technologies they're interested in to expand this idea of what could be next. Because as you heard from Weston, they're really at a loss of what else they can be doing. I do think the thermal drone would be a, a really impressive tool to be able to use. I could, I could just drive the road here at night, know where all the sheep are sleeping that night, fly out, check stuff. If I see, you know, see 
bears or wolves coming towards that band, I know I could get over there and, and help hopefully stop predation with that deal. Or maybe you could use the drone itself to buzz them and, and yeah. keep them out of there. I don't know. And it just so happens that Jared is working with producer groups to test and innovate techniques for real-time remote detection of activity on a ranch. In Montana's Paradise Valley, folks were interested in a tool that could focus on 24-7 monitoring. Remember, these Montana producers are living with wolves and grizzlies. So one of the areas that's of interest, they want to be able to reduce risk to humans and livestock. This technology has improved so much. When I came on with the Bighorn Sheep Program in California in 2010, they were trying to use thermal imaging to monitor population size. And at the time, the technology just wasn't there yet. It's exciting to hear that these tools are becoming more practical. This field really is exploding. The commercial availability and advancements of this technology is rapidly evolving. It's more affordable than ever. The drones, the payloads, the thermal sensors, all of it's advancing. And this opens their use to all sorts of ecological applications. And thermal imagery is an important part of this. These sensors detect reflections of heat sources, like mammals, which thermoregulate. This provides an important advantage Animals can be detected at night, and for many predators like wolves, that's when they're most active. That's right, and one example of how far this tech has come is some work I've done in collaboration with Wake Forest and Auburn Universities. We were able to survey a white-tailed deer population of a known number with up to 92% certainty, and while there's still a lot to learn about all this new tech, that's pretty crazy. And not only is 92% a really high degree of certainty for a population estimate, it's also a significant advantage over human-powered aerial surveys because it's safer. It takes the biologist out of airplanes and helicopters. And remember, aviation accidents are the number one cause of death among wildlife biologists. And when I got this job with MSU Extension, working on human-related needs surrounding wildlife issues really became a key focus, and conflict mitigation is one that's been coming up a lot. And I think there's value in exploring the potential use of some of this tech to also help producers mitigate wildlife conflict, whether that's disease transmission, depredation events, or a suite of other concerns. And drones are already being implemented really successfully in the field of wildlife damage management. USDA Wildlife Services, who are already involved in grizzly bear and wolf management in Montana, are using drones for thermal imaging of feral swine in the south, where feral swine are an invasive species causing huge amounts of habitat destruction. And this technology is really helping to prevent further losses and maintain working farms and ranches. We've been wanting to get into something like a thermal drone that would be a good way to, maybe you could check bands of sheep at night and maybe you could use the drone to haze things away. Um, You can't see it in the dark without the thermal and those are, you know, starting out at $10,000 drones going up from there. Um, I use thermal up here, you know, that was going back to just the, the stress of this stuff. A lot of times when I come up here, I stay out till two, three, four o'clock night you know, spend most of the day sleeping when there's not a lot going on and then go back to work at night, walking around, checking on the bands at night, stuff like that. We've started using some drones a little bit. Um, There's a lot of limitations with those. Can't fly that far, that long. Um, It gets windy up here. You can't fly that well when it's windy. Um, The nice drones that have cameras with optical zoom that you could actually see something from a decent height, you know, they're really expensive. These are not polished and they're certainly not perfect solutions, but there is value and the technology is there and advancing, but we still need to learn where they can work and where they don't. And that takes producer involvement throughout the entire process. And another tool that Jared has been working on is a smart game camera with the ability to detect different species and relay information to the rancher in real time. If a bear or wolf comes walking by, a producer could be notified by text. And this can help producers more efficiently target human presence, employ scare devices, or other conflict prevention techniques. 
So theoretically, you can do that now. It just takes a lot of steps and a whole team of experts. But what we're really talking about is streamlining these processes into a single user-friendly package. And the real advantage of the machine learning is that you get rid of the non-essential information. You don't get a text every time a blade of grass blows in the wind. And it's plenty windy here. Yeah, and, and we're not just talking about a handful of images. I used 30 cameras over the course of five months and I was left with over a million images. Most of these were empty. How is that useful? One of my favorite lines from one of my mentors is that as scientists, we're really good at drowning in data while being starved for information. This streamlined kind of analysis is what's really needed, where a network of cameras can work together in real time to detect carnivore presence and communicate that to the landowner. Speaking of keeping things cowgirl friendly, if it's not easy to use, then it's not worth the investment. We're talking about people with already full plates. To bring this back to the lethal conversation, there's a lot of thought going into how we can potentially use facial recognition in the wildlife world. And with these new cameras, it's not a stretch to think that in the near future, we could have the capacity to ID wildlife down to the individual causing the problem. And that would be a tremendous asset for wildlife managers. This could work both to protect livestock and reduce the need for full pack removals in the future. Really a win-win solution. Really, I think that's where we're headed. I mean, we're talking about being very close to package deals like the Roomba for ranch operations. So I just finished an, an experiment. We have a captive coyote facility where we're able to kind of play with concepts. And we, were, we wanted to know like what is the potential of say robotics or drones like does this does this present a scarier kind of scenario that makes deterrence better and the results were striking because we you know we had we did a nice experiment where we just had a light that activated and then we used a device that would move that light around in a set pattern and then we had a device that would actually kind of react to what the coyote was doing and you know, far and away, that device that reacts to the coyote was just over the top superior. And you look at that and you say, all right, this is justification for, for pursuing this. It's also, uh, you know, you start thinking about it, it's like, well, that's basically a livestock guarding dog, you know, because they react to the predators, they, they're they continually trying to sense them. And so it in some senses, you're like, well, we have this product already, but there are there are probably situations where a livestock guarding dog isn't isn't appropriate or you know presents challenges that are hard to overcome, and so I I think there's a lot of room for developing kind of the technological side to that. These emerging technologies are a way to manage risk on an operation and improve efficiency. But let's be clear. We are not talking about engineering the people out of ranching. Human observation of the landscape and human capacity to tend to livestock will always be a part of good stewardship. That's a really important point, Alex. These technologies that I and and other researchers are pursuing are things producers have already been using. Remote trail cameras are not new. We're just trying to make them more useful. And freeing up producers' time will give them the space they need to continue to be thoughtful when faced with expanding predator populations. Remember what Cole Manick said in episode three. We just got to get them more breathing room so they can be thoughtful about natural resources. Most people are pretty darn thoughtful when you don't squeeze them down to the bottom line. Improving these tools and providing funding for their implementation is one way to keep producers from being squeezed out. It means that folks can actually sleep at night and keep their livestock safe. Next time on Working Wild U, Jared and I will be wrapping this season up while taking you to Colorado, where a ballot-driven wolf reintroduction effort is currently underway. Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation. Western Sayre, and listeners like you. Today's episode was directed and edited by Zach Altman 
and produced by Matthew Collins, Zach Altman, Alex Few, Jared Beaver, and Abby Nelson. Our hosts are Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Lewis Wirtz is our executive producer. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Weston Helly, Cameron Krebs, Stuart Breck, and Cole Mannix. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.